à ma montre, il est 10h du matin. I make it 10 o'clock. I would therefore like to say a very good morning to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you've had a very good weekend. Perhaps the Chinese delegation hasn't had quite such a good weekend, given all of the answers that they had to prepare to the questions that we posed on Friday. So I would call to order then the 2,655th meeting of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This meeting sees the continuation of the discussion of the 14th to the 17th periodic reports of China. On Friday last, The Chinese delegation and the head of delegation received a great number of questions from my colleagues on the committee. This amount of questions is a clear demonstration of the interest that the committee attaches to the situation in your country. I am sure that in preparing your replies, as I said uh, previously, that it took up a great deal of your weekend. And that is why, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the delegation to reply to the questions that were asked on Friday. After having heard the replies from the delegation to the questions posed on Friday, I will then turn back to members of our committee for them to react. To the answers given, They will then have an opportunity to ask further questions as part of an interactive dialogue with the delegation. Without further ado then, I give the floor to the head of delegation for him to answer the questions raised by the committee. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Distinguished Chair, members, good morning. At our dialogue last Friday, the Chinese delegation gave a presentation of the new progress achieved in China, including Hong Kong and Macau SARs, in implementing the convention and in protecting the rights of ethnic groups. We also listened to the comment by members and their numerous questions. Following the schedule at this meeting, in a cooperative and responsive attitude, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. I mean questions from the members. I would like to emphasize that the Chinese delegation has provided informative report and materials which fully demonstrate that 
China's rapid progress in implementing the convention and in protecting and promoting the rights and interests of ethnic minorities are tangible, visible, and are, and are achieved through hard work. This is the result of joint efforts of all ethnic groups in China, of which we're, we're most proud. Of course, as we mentioned last Friday, we're keenly aware that as a developing multi-ethnic country with a large population, we still have room for improvements in some regards. For this purpose, we always attach importance to the role of the committee, and we hope that all members will take a comprehensive and objective approach to China's um, efforts for implementation and provide constructive suggestions in this regard. Now we will answer the concrete questions raised by members. We have sorted out and put into categories the questions uh, for experts from departments in charge to answer respectively. Meanwhile, we have provided an unofficial English translation of the answers for your reference. Since there are almost 100 questions from members, we might need a bit more time in order to give comprehensive answers. We thank you for your understanding. First of all, I would like to answer the questions of Mr. Mr. Maruga, Mr. Kut on China's implementation of its National Human Rights Action Plan. I thank the committee for recognizing the role and importance of National Human Rights Action Plan, or the plan for short. Now, the Chinese government is making midterm assessment of the midterm of the plan. We have provided a document with the key data for your reference. Maybe you have already received it. Here, I would uh, talk about a few items here. Generally speaking, good progress has been made in achieving the goals set concerning minority groups. The right to participation in political affairs has been guaranteed. All the 55 ethnic minority groups are represented in the NPC and CPPCC. Members of the ethnic minorities account for 14.7 percent of the deputies to the 13th NPC and 11 percent of the members of the 13th CPPCC, both higher than the 8.49 percent, the population share of ethnic minorities to the national total. The head of administration of the 155 ethnic autonomous localities, including prefectures, counties, and banners, are led by officials from ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities and areas uh, experience rapid economic social progress. In 2017, the eight ethnic minority regions saw their investment in fixed assets amount to 8.873 trillion yuan, growing by 11.8 percent, 4.6 percent points higher than the national average. average. Poor population in ethnic minority areas has dropped from 14.11 million in 2016 to 10.32 million in 2017. 21 out of the 28 poor counties that have successfully eradicated poverty in that rare, in that um, year are located in the western ethnic, ethnic minority areas. Education for ethnic minorities has developed rapidly. China has exempted rural students from all tuition and fees for compulsory education, providing uh, students uh, from difficult areas with help and uh, uh, fee is exempted for 18, 15 years of compulsory education. Ethnic minorities' right to use and develop their own languages has been effectively protected. In 2017, the central government's special allowances for ethnic education allocated to allocated 200 million yuan for training bilingual teachers in ethnic minority areas. The special funds for bilingual education for ethnic minorities invested 20 billion yuan to support the compilation and translation of bilingual teaching materials. The, in the inheritance and protection of ethnic minorities' cultures have been enhanced constantly. 25 provinces, including autonomous regions and municipalities, directly under the central government, have set up ancient groups, compilation, research organizations. 
So far, 14 ethnic minority projects have been put on the UNESCO Masterpieces of the Orient Intangible Heritage of Humanity. 479 ethnic minority works have been put on the catalog of national intangible cultural heritage. In addition, we have also prepared a written material on the implementation of the 25-year plan for the economic development of the border areas for your reference. This is already submitted to members for your reference. To answer Mr. Maragon's question on how to ensure that the Belt and Road Initiative benefits the, the ethnic minorities, this BRI has greatly boosted opening up in ethnic minority areas, serving as a strong driver to the rapid development there. In the vision and actions on jointly building the Belt and Road issued with the State Council authorization, ethnic minority areas' critical roles have been explicitly stated. The Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region serves as a core area on the Silk Road Economic Belt. The Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region uh, key windows opening to the north, and the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, an important gateway connecting the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century Maritime Silk Road, to name but a few. Now, in these areas under the BRI, remarkable achievements have been made in these areas. For example, Xinjiang has become a major corridor of energy and resources on land. A large-scale oil and gas processing and reserve base a large-scale base of coal, coal-fired electricity and coal chemical industry, a large-scale wind power base and a hub of transportation, commercial logistics, financing, medical services, culture and technology. Ningxia, as a link between China's resource-rich areas and its main consumer market, with its advantageous location, has gained the edge on processing, reserving, transmitting resources from the Middle East and Central Asia. As a result, it has become an inland pilot area of open up and full crumb on the Silk Road economic belt. To answer the question of Mr. Marugan on China's plan to set up a human rights institution, Instead of establishing a standalone human rights institution, China designates the responsibilities of protecting and promoting human rights to different departments according to their mandates. For example, there are Office of Letters and Calls of the People's Congresses and governmental departments at all levels to accept, investigate, and handle human rights violations. The supervisory departments oversee the actions of government agencies and officials and accept and handle human rights-related reports. The State Ethnic Affairs Commission bears significant responsibility for protecting and promoting the rights of ethnic minorities. To reply Mr. Murillo's call for China's support to the World Conference Against the Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, Relating Tolerance, and the International Decade for People of African Descent, China supports implementation of the Durban Declaration Program Action, the International Decade for People of African Descent, set by UNGA, provides the international community a valuable opportunity to focus on racial discrimination, face a history of slavery squarely, and improve the lives of people of African descent. China supports a strong action plan for the international decade for people of African descent. To answer the question raised by, by Mrs. Isaac and Mr. Chung on the citizens of DPRK who illegally entered China, we have stated China's position on multiple occasions, which is to properly handle the issue according to international law, domestic laws, and international principles and humanitarian principles. Hereby, I would like to add a few points. First, the citizens of DPRK who entered China illegally did it out of economic reasons. Therefore, they do not qualify as refugees as defined by the Refugee Convention. Two, 
a great amount of humanitarian assistance has been offered by the Chinese people to the citizens of the DPRK who entered China, and a so-called serious exploitation or maltreatment does not exist. Third, the report of the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK was mentioned on Friday. But the establishment of the commission met with reservation from many states, including China in the first place. As to the report issued by the U.S. State Department, we hope that members of the committee could consider whether the impartiality and credibility of the report were affected by political situation at the time. And fourth, to members with an interest in this issue, I recommend an article from The Guardian titled, Why Do North Korean Defectors' Testimonies So Often Fall Apart?, published on October 13, 2015. Now, I would like to ask the State uh, Poverty Relation uh, Department to answer questions. The floor. Um, to answer Mr. Marugan's question on poverty of ethnic minorities and poverty re-education, I thank you for recognizing China's efforts and achievements in ethnic minority areas. We're keenly aware of the arduous nature of poverty reduction in ethnic minority areas. Poverty-stricken areas are mainly located in the central and western regions of China due to historical reasons. But within the same region, poverty doesn't differentiate between different ethnic minorities. Together, the 12 provinces, region cities in western China where ethnic minorities concentrate have a population of 374 million, accounting for 27.06% accounting for of the total. But poor population there is 16.34 million, which is 53.64% of the total of the country. Poverty is mainly surveyed and registered by regions. Thus, the ethnicity disaggregated poverty head headcount ratio is not available yet. Here, I would like to emphasize that the Chinese government has announced that it will see that no ethnic minority shall be left behind in enjoying the moderate prosperity in all respects. To this end, we have adopted extraordinary measures and policies to lift them out of poverty. The additional state funding policies and projects are mainly channeled to ethnic minority areas. For example, in 2018, 60% of the central government's additional funding is earmarked for the three regions and the three prefectures to benefit the 3 million impoverished population or 10% of the country's total. The three regions, Tibet, Southern Xinjiang, and district in four provinces that are mainly inhabited by Tibetans, three uh, prefectures, Ningxia Prefecture, in Yunnan, etc. The The central government has uh, appropriated over 1 billion yuan to Xinjiang for poverty reduction this year alone, or 10% of the year's total fund. For ethnic minorities, the past five years has witnessed the rapid increase in people's living standards and their sense of fulfillment. To answer Mr. Silva's question on relocation of impoverished population, to relocate poor people from in hospitable areas is a decision made out of two reasons. One, as industrialization and urbanization accelerate, rural areas are hollowing out with a decreasing population, making infrastructure improvement and public services very costly. Second, ecological environment in most of poor areas is vulnerable the pasturing areas in particular due to overgrazing. We relocate the poor people to the suburbs of small towns to ease the eco, the eco environmental stress and let the natural ecosystem to recover and regenerate itself. 
The Chinese government has formulated a special plan for this decision during the 13th five-year plan period to define the targets, tasks, and supporting policies. An increase in Chinese financial resources enables us to give stronger support to poor population there. For each person living on the poverty line, the state offers 60,000 yuan of concessional loan to better them uh, to help them better settle. We have built high quality residence areas, improved infrastructure, and ensured good education and health care. We help them seek better. Uh, seek career development. We have been working to create jobs by supporting local industries. Besides their destinations, we also take into account the land restoration and ecological restoration in their hometowns. Out of respect of the ethnic minorities, we have invited them to participate in choosing and building their new residence sites. What's the let me share what I saw at a relocation site known as the Xi Xu Qian village in uh, Chuxing County of Tibet Autonomous Region. The building of the relocation residence site started in August and completed in December 2016. The village is located along the Lhasa River, 20 kilometers from the Gunga Airport, and very close to local train station. There are in total 1,256 villagers in 273 households coming from high altitude areas and uh, ecological preservation areas. 489 out of the 615 workforce have found a new livelihood means, among which 241 plant herbs and breed cattle for a living. The per capita disposable income in that village is 9,969 yuan. Compulsory education has covered the whole village with 336 students at school. The village's previous farmland, house sites, and properties have been given to agencies for management for renting and other forms so that the farmers will benefit. Next, I will give the floor to Ho Xiaoguang, Director of the Legislative Affairs Commission, Standing Committee of National People's Congress. First of all, I wish to answer Mr. Marugan's question on the uh, definition of racial discrimination and anti-racial discrimination law. On racial equality protection and anti-racial discrimination issues, China has a comprehensive legal system underpinned by the Constitution to promote ethnic equality and prohibit racial discrimination in line with the spirit of the Convention. Some of these laws include the law on regional national autonomy, electoral law, labor law, and employment promotion law, law on the standard spoken and written Chinese language, education law, criminal law, public security administration punishment law. The convention has been fully implemented, therefore. Though there is no definition on racial discrimination, the understanding and interpretation of racial discrimination by the legislature, judicial authority, and administrative departments is consistent with the convention. China will continue to strengthen the implementation of the anti-discrimination provisions relating to the Constitution and improve the anti-discrimination contents in specific laws to provide sufficient legal support for anti-discrimination work. Secondly, to answer Mr. Marugan's question on how to ensure that anti-separatism, anti-extremism, and anti-terrorism laws are consistent with the Convention. We believe that the legislative spirit of Chinese laws on combating illegal and criminal acts of the three forces is consistent with the basic principles of the Convention. The Convention forbids racial hatred and opposes discrimination and inequality among different races. 
To combat extremism and terrorism is what has been agreed on by the international community. The UN Security Council has repeatedly adopted resolutions calling on all countries to take effective measures to curb any speech and acts of extremism and terrorism. For a long time, the three forces uh, to achieve the purpose of undermining national unity and instigating ethnic division have planned and organized in the name of ethnic religion and human rights, separatist activities and violent terrorist activities in Xinjiang and other places in China. Their acts have caused serious damages to the safety and the stability of our country, endangering the safety of life of the people of all ethnic groups and undermining the sound ethnic unity. It is stipulated in Section 2, Article 4 of the Counterterrorism Law that the state opposes extremism in all forms, including distorting religious doctrines or other means to incite hatred, discrimination, and violence, and eliminates the ideological basis of terrorism. At the same time, Article 6 of the law stipulates that counterterrorism work should be carried out in accordance with the law to respect and safeguard human rights and the lawful rights and interests of citizens and organizations. In the work of counterterrorism, citizens' freedom of religious belief and national customs should be respected, and any discrimination practices based on geographical, ethnic, or religious reasons should be prohibited. Chinese law enforcement agencies earnestly implement the national policy on ethnic minorities, strictly enforce laws and uh, regulations, give equal treatment to people of all ethnic groups in law enforcement to fully respect the lawful rights and interests of suspects, consistently adhere to strict standard, fair and civilized law enforcement, and forbid any discriminatory practices against ethnic minorities. To answer Mr. Madugo's um, question on the crimes of uh, endangering national security, laws including inter-alien amendments to the criminal law, the national security law, the counterterrorism law, and the cyber security law of China stipulate on the measures and the procedures to safeguard national security, public security, and the security of people's lives and property, and clearly stipulates those who jeopardize national security should be investigated for criminal liability in accordance with the criminal law. The regulation on religious affairs provides that where one commits a crime by preaching, supporting, or funding religious extremism, or taking advantage of religion to undermine ethnic solidarity, split the state, or carry out ter terrorist activities in violation of the law, he shall be uh, investigated for criminal liability in accordance with the criminal law. Article 3 of the criminal law stipulates uh, the principle that crimes and punishments shall be prescribed by law. Chapter 1 of Part 2 of the criminal law stipulates uh, in detail the crimes of endangering national security, the national security law, counterterrorism, and the cyber security law, and the regulation on religious affairs. Each contain provisions that correlate with the above-mentioned provisions of the criminal law. Provisions of the laws are specific and clear. There is no basis for the so-called ambiguity in the provision of the crimes endangering national security. Thank you. Next, I give the floor to uh, Ms. Jin Chunzi from um, SEAC. First of all, I answer Mr. Merrigan's question on the complaints of discrimination from ethnic minorities. The Chinese government attaches great importance to the implementation of the provisions against ethnicity-based discrimination in the Constitution and other laws and the regulations. The central government has issued documents to subnational governments ordering the provision and handling of ethnic discrimination practices, both indirect and direct. To ensure the implementation, there are special inspection projects on a long-term basis. For example, in 2014, the United Front Work Department, uh, the SEAC, the Public Security and the Civil Affairs and the Human Resources and the Social Security, Transport and the Civil Aviation Administration jointly circulated a notice on um, undertaking inspection and uh, supervision over prohibitions of discriminatory practices against ethnic minorities in some regions. 
demanding that local authorities resolutely ban discriminatory practices against ethnic minorities existing in some regions. In 2015, the Ministry of Public Security, the SEAC, and the State Civil Aviation Administration released documents one after another to specifically address ethnic discrimination or disguised discriminatory practices against ethnic minorities. From 2008 to 2014, SEAC, together with other competent authorities, conducted four instances of special supervision over the implementation of ethnic laws. In early 2015, a joint supervision group sent by the central government undertook special supervision over seven provinces and municipalities, including Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Guangdong, and Henan. Other localities have taken similar measures to ensure equal opportunities enjoyed by people of all ethnic groups. Some local authorities have set up community legal aid centers and made hotlines available to ethnic minorities. Some law firms offer legal consulting and legal aid to provide ethnic minorities with consulting and legal resources should they suffer any discrimination. Let me emphasize that in China, any victim of criminal behaviors has the right to report to the public security organs. After receiving the report, the public security organs shall take measures according to law to stop the crime and impose public security administration punishment on the offenders or transfer the case to the judicial organ for criminal punishment. After careful Examination of the facts and evidence relevant judgments are accessible on the web websites of the Supreme People's Court. The second question is uh, from Mr. Silver on the unrecognized ethnic minorities. Starting from 1949, the Chinese government has identified 55 ethnic minorities successively through ethnic identification process and fully ensured their rights endowed by the Constitution and under laws on an equal footing. There is no unrecognized ethnic minority in China. In China's population consensus, uh, census, there are around 600,000 unidentified people, which is still fully and uh, equally enjoy their rights despite the fact that their ethnic identities have not been confirmed yet due to uh, complex uh, reasons. Thank you. Next, I give the floor to Mr. Li to Ms. Li Jian from SEAC. Thank you. I will answer the question by Mr. Marigan about NGO management laws and the charity laws. The purpose of these two laws is to protect the legitimate rights and interests of all individuals and organizations involved in charity activities, including foreign NGOs, and to regulate their activities in China, including charitable activities. This reflects uh, the principle of rule of law. This reflects the principle of rule of law. When a foreign NGO applies for registration, it should first ob obtain the consent of the competent department. This will enable the government to, to better facilitate serve and manage the activities of NGOs. The provisions of the two laws, together with the dual management system, are equally applicable to NGOs both at home and abroad. 
In recent years, um, public security organs, uh, civil affairs departments, and other relevant departments at all levels uh, have made great efforts to facilitate the activities of foreign NGOs operating in China in accordance with the law. For example, the Ministry of Civil Affairs, uh, where I am from, recently wrote out uh, regulations to see that the Ministry of Civil Affairs serves as a competent department to facilitate NGOs' activities. It has been a month since then, and um, the ministry has received three applications and many consulting phone calls. I believe more and more foreign NGOs will register and carry out activities in China according to law in the future. Thank you. Now I give the floor to uh, Ming Haiyun from the National Immigration Administration. To answer the question raised by Mr. Morgan and Mr. Murillo Martinez on the statistics of non-citizens, including the numbers of non-citizens classified by nationality, in 2017, the top 20 source countries of foreigners bound for China are South Korea. South Korea, Japan, Russia, the US, Mongolia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, India, Canada, Thailand, Australia, Indonesia, Germany, Britain, France, Italy, Laos, Korea, and uh, Kazakhstan. The detailed numbers are in the attached materials. By July 2018, there are in total 1.28 million foreigners in China. About uh, 530,000 of them are long-term residents. The second question from Mr. Morgan is on the legislation of the anti-human trafficking law and the Chinese uh, action plan against human trafficking. From 2013 to 2020, China has not yet formulated a special law against human trafficking yet. However, many of the provisions of the current law apply to combating human and criminal activities, uh, illegal and criminal activities involving human trafficking. In 2013, the government formulated the National Action Plan 2013 to 2020, which improves the working mechanisms and provides a solid institutional guarantee for preventing and combating human trafficking. The plan calls for the formulation and the revision of relevant laws and regulations to provide support for the work of anti-kidnapping. The amendment to the criminal law of the People's Republic of China released in August 2015 deletes the provision of Article 241 that persons who purchase women or children trafficked may not be held accountable for criminal responsibilities, and the person who purchased trafficked population shall now be also held criminally responsible for their acts. Recently, such judicial interpretations released in the interpretation regarding several issues concerning the application of specific laws on hearing cases of abducting and trafficking women and children and the interpretation on concerned issues and the application of law on handling crime cases regarding organizing, forcing, seducing, accommodating, and introducing prostitution have formed a coherent standard on the application of laws. The relevant departments of Chinese government will continue to do a good job and the public security authority to strictly crack down all kinds of kidnapping and trafficking. China ratified the protocol against uh, trafficking in persons, and it is applicable to the Macau SAR. Next, uh, the question from Ms. Isaac Nadia on the legislation and the statistics of refugees. In recent years, the competent Chinese authorities have been actively studying the possibility of formulating domestic laws governing the application for and recognition of refugee status. 
the exit and entry administration law of China formulated in June 2012 as a clause that allows for the issuance of certificates of temporary stay to people who apply for the refugee status and the issuance of certificates of residence to people who have had their application approved. And we will continue to study and formulate legislation governing refugee affairs. By June 30, 2018, according to UNHCR data, there are 943 foreign refugees and asylum seekers in China, of which 216 were identified as refugees by the respective office, and 727 were asylum seekers waiting for identification. They are from 46 countries, um, such as uh, Liberia, Somalia, Cameroon, and uh, the most are from Liberia, totaling 127, Somalia 111, Cameroon 105, Zimbabwe 89, Syria 74, and uh, Nigeria 56. Thank you. Next, uh, Gao Ming from the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security. I will answer two questions. First, uh, Mr. Marugan's question on the employment of ethnic minorities. Chinese laws such as the labor law, the employment promotion law, and uh, the law on regional ethnic autonomy explicitly prohibit employment discrimination based on ethnicity and religion. They also give uh, preferential treatments to ethnic minorities. While protecting the rights and interests of workers from ethnic minorities, um, the government um, puts employment first and adopts uh, more active employment policies in effort to optimize the employment environment, to widen the employment channels, and enhance public services and uh, promote their employment. The main measures are following. First, by issuing state government documents, the State Council has implemented a series of positive and effective employment policies with a view to promoting employment and entrepreneurship of all workers, including members of the ethnic minorities, and to promoting the transfer of rural laborers to other industries. The second one is to improve the public employment services system covering both urban and rural areas, support the development of platforms and capacities for labor and employment services provision at the grassroots level in ethnic minority areas, and to use the Internet Plus Human Resources and Social Security Action Plan to make public employment services more technology-based and professional in a bit to provide workers in ethnic minority areas with convenient access to quality employment services. In this respect, the Chinese government has undertaken a series of special service campaigns, for example, Employment Assistance Month, Spring Wind Initiative and private enterpri enterprises recruitment work week activities on a yearly basis to provide targeted employment services for all types of workers. For example, the Bulgakin County in Xinjiang encourages enterprises to recruit employees who are permanent local residents by giving business pension insurance allowances in an amount equal to 50% of the premiums they have actually paid provided that they have newly recruited no less than 50% of employees who are permanent local residents. Third, based on the paired-up assistance and collaboration on poverty alleviation between eastern and western regions mechanisms, promote labor cooperation between the ethnic minority areas and the developed provinces, autonomous regions and municipalities in the coastal and inland areas in order to improve the organization of labor export from ethnic minority areas to increase the scale of members of ethnic minorities to work in the developed coastal and inland areas.
areas, adhere to the working mechanism featuring a combination of employment services, school training, and labor rights protection to further improve the equal employment system for urban and rural areas, workers to provide members of ethnic minorities with equal public employment services and inclusive employment policies through public employment services agencies. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has tightened labor inspection and market supervision to prevent and correct discriminatory practices and provisions that may arise in recruitment and job hunting services to protect the legal rights and interests of the ethnic minorities in employment. Currently, there is no statistics on the employment rate and unemployment rate classified by ethnic groups in China. But we can provide statistics on the employment rate and unemployment rate in eight ethnic province, uh, provinces and autonomous regions. Taking 2017 as an example, the number of employed workers nationwide reached 776.4 million. The number of newly employed workers in urban areas was 13.51 million. And the registered unemployment rate in urban areas was 3.9%. The unemployment rate in the eight ethnic minority provinces and regions are on average lower than the national average. Further information is attached in our written materials. Next, I'd like to answer the second question raised by Mr. Morrigan, that is on the ILO's conventions and migrant workers' rights conventions. China is indeed serious and responsible in ratifying and implementing the ILO conventions as a permanent member of the ILO Council. Chinese laws explicitly ban forced labor and are generally in line with the of the 1930 Forced Labour Convention and the 1957 abolition, abolition of Forced Labour Convention. Chinese Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, together with the ILO, organized a seminar in the theme of China's ratification of the forced labor and will be strictly forbidden forced labor. And the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security, together with the ILO, organized a seminar in the theme of China's ratification of the Forced Labor Convention in November 2017. China will continue to exert efforts in this area in, f in the future. With regard to the Convention on Industrial and Commercial Labor and Supervision and the 2011 Domestic Workers Convention, the Chinese government has also attached great importance to the healthy development of domestic services industries and to the protection of labor rights and the interests of domestic workers. The competent authorities in China will cooperate with the ILO and set up research into possibilities of ratifying these two uh, conventions. Regarding the Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and the Members of Their Families, in principle, China agrees with the purpose and the mission of the International Convention on Protection of the Rights of Migrant Workers. As cases of foreign workers working in China and of Chinese nationals increase in recent years, China is willing to study the possibility of ratifying the convention in an earnest manner. That is all to my replies. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ms. Shen Chun-shan from the Edu Ministry of Education to re answer questions. Good morning. Let me um, respond to the question raised by Ms. 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 Shepard and Mr. Diaby about the education and language of ethnic minorities. First of all, the report on China's implementation of the convention has already given a detailed in introduction to the legal protection of the use and development of the ethnic languages in China. I would like to add the following. The implementation of bilingual education in ethnic minority areas in China is a concrete measure to respect and guarantee the right of the ethnic minorities to receive education in their own languages. It is also a measure to enable ethnic minorities to master the commonly used language while learning and using their own languages so that to ensure that every Chinese citizen are fully, can fully utilize them to enjoy equal rights in political life 
and the fruits of the state's e country's economic and modern development and to improve the ability of minority students to move towards society and to participate in social life. The detailed information on bilingual teaching in the ethnic minority areas is included in the written materials. In some ethnic minority areas, the local people use ethnic minority languages in their daily life and the popularity of the commonly used language is still relatively low. We are strengthening the education of the commonly used language and characters and to strive to make ethnic minority students master both languages. Bilingual education in Xinjiang and Tibet is fully guaranteed in terms of bilingual teachers, curricula, textbooks and class time. The class time of ethnic languages and Chinese is roughly the same in the period of basic education. Practices have proved that bilingual education is conducive to better and faster development of the ethnic minorities, conforms to the fundamental interests of the ethnic minority areas and are broadly welcomed by the minorities. The statements that Xinjiang and Houtan prohibits teaching in Uyghur language and bilingual, bilingual education aims at causing ethnic minority language to be replaced are not true. As for Ms. Shepard's question on protection, the impl implementation of the laws and policies to protect the languages of ethnic minorities, the Chinese government protects the right of ethnic minorities to use and develop their own languages according to law. Nearly 40 laws and regulations, including the Constitution of the People's Republic of China and the law on regional ethnic autonomy, have provided for the use and development of languages of ethnic minority groups. Of the 55 ethnic minorities in China, 53 had their own languages except the Hui and Manchu languages, and 22 uses 28 languages altogether. Chinese law clearly guarantees the use of minority languages. The languages of ethnic minorities have been widely used in both political and social life across China. For example, such important conventions as the MPC and the CPCC all provide documents and simultaneous interpretation in the languages of Mongolian, Tibetan, Uyghur, Kazakh, Korean, Yi and Zhong people. This includes the documents and simultaneous interpretation. Nearly 200 radio stations broadcast in 25 minority languages. Ethnic minorities' languages are allowed to be used in the National College Entrance Examination. The Chinese government encourages ethnic autonomous regions to gradually implement bilingual teaching in ethnic minority languages and commonly used languages, supports the research, development, compilation and publication of bilingual textbooks to help train bilingual teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next will be uh, Ms. Liu Hongli to respond to certain questions. To answer the question raised by Mr. Dibia about the prenatal care and hospitalization for pregnant and lying in women, in 2009, the new health care reform of China established the core concept of providing basic medical and health system as public product for all. In October 2016, the CPC Central Committee and the State Council circulated the Healthy China 2030 blueprint, specifying that a basic health care system with Chinese characters covering both urban and rural residents will be established by the year 2020, and institutions and systems aims to promote healthy healthiness for all will be improved. The quality of health care services and the level of health protection will be heightened, fairness in health will be basically realized, and China will rank among high-income countries in terms of key health indicators by the year 2030. In recent years, rural health services in China, including ethnic minority areas, have developed rapidly. The goals of having one county, one hospital, one health center in each center in each township, and one health room in 
each administrative village have been basically realized. Currently, 90.3% of households are within three kilometers from the nearest medical in institution, and 63.9% of them are within one kilometer from the nearest medical institution. The specific measures adopted are as follows. First, through the implementation of the capacity building projects of the county level maternal and child health care institutions in the central and western regions, the reducing and the project of eliminating neonatal titanus and the project of charitable medical sunshine relief, etc., special funds are inclined to ethnic minority areas for maternal and child health care institutions to allocate necessary equipment and carry out housing maintenance and renovation. Secondly, we are carrying out projects such as cultural sensitive pregnancy and health care services in ethnic minority areas. Thirdly, we are promoting the development of maternal and child health undertakings in poverty-stricken ethnic minority areas to provide professional training on per maternal and child health in Xinjiang and Tibet. Through our efforts, the ethnic minority areas have uh, improved the uh, level of maternal and child health care in ethnic minority areas. Further information are included in the attached written materials. Uh, the second question by Mr. Dibia uh, is on the organ transplantation. In 2007, China promulgated and implemented the Ordinance on Human Organ Transplantation, which stipulates organ donation and transplantation in detail. In 2011, the Eighth Amendment to the Criminal Law was promote, promulgated and put into effect which further defined the informed consent of organ donation and organ training more strictly and cracked down on illegal acts. Organ donation and transplantation in China follow the following principles. First, voluntary donation of organ donation. The second is the informed consent of organ donation that is, the explicit consent. The third is to avoid conflicts of interest. The fourth is ethical review. The fifth is strict control of living organ transplantation. Living organ donation in China is limited to donations from relatives. The sixth is to ensure the scientific, fair and impartial distribution of organs. The seventh is to make clear the organ donation can be traced back to management. The eighth is to strictly crack down on illegal activities. Currently, China has initially established a human organ transplantation work system, including donation system, acquisition and distribution system, transplant clinical service clinical service system, post-transplant scientific registration system, and transplant service supervision system. Since uh, January 1st, 2015, all organ transplants have come from voluntary donations after the death of citizens and living organ donations between relatives. To answer the third question is from Mr. Marugan about infant mortality in different ethnic areas and how it has changed over the past decade. The infant mortality rate in the whole country dropped from 13.8 per thousand in, 19, in 2009 to uh, 6.8 per thousand in 2017. The indicators of eight ethnic provinces and regions are listed in the written materials. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I would like to ask Ms. Sung Jiwa from the Ministry of Justice to respond to questions. Let me uh, respond to a question by Mr. Kut about protecting the law's freedom of legal practice. 
the Chinese government and judicial authorities always attach great importance to ensuring lawyers' legal practice in accordance with the law. In recent years in particular, the judicial reform towards the goal of promoting rule of law in all respects has re regarded the efforts to deepen the lawyer's system and ensure lawyers' right to practice law as an important dimension and has taken a series of measures accordingly. The criminal procedural law, as revised in March 2012, incorporates relevant provisions of the lawyer's law and therefore improved provisions governing the lawyer's right to interview their clients, read case files and collect evidence by investigation, and etc. In September 2015, the Supreme People's Court, the Supreme People's Procuratorate, the Ministry of Public Security, the Ministry of State Security, the Ministry of Justice jointly issued the provisions on securing the right of lawyers to legal practice according to law, clarifying the general requirements for authorities to protect the lawyer's right to practice law and putting forward concrete safeguard measures. In September 2016, Supreme People's Court, the Supreme People's Procurate, the Ministry of Public Security, the Ministry of Secu uh, State Security and the Ministry of Justice jointly circulated the opinions on advancing the reform towards the trial-centered criminal procedural system, which further improved the rules for debate during court trial to ensure that the court fully has the opinions of both the prosecuting and defending sides and to protect the rights to debate and defend on the part of the defendants and their defence lawyers. In April 2015, 2018, the Supreme People's Court, the Ministry of Justice, jointly circulated the notice on lawfully protecting the procedural rights of lawyers and regulating lawyers' participation in the trial activities, which sets forth explicit requirements for authorities to reasonably allocate the time for all parties to question, challenge, represent, debate, and defend, and to fully hear the opinions of lawyers. In 2017, April 2017, the Supreme People's Court, the Su Supreme People's Pro Procuratorate, the Minister of Public Security, the Minister of State Security, the Ministry of Justice, of, and the All China Lawyers Association jointly created a joint quick response mechanism to safeguard lawyers' right to legal practice. The authority has announced to the public their names, telephone numbers, and addresses of the agencies designated by them to accept complaints by, made by lawyers with respect to violations of the right to legal practice, thus resolving the problem that lawyers have no way to complain about their rights being violated and effectively maintaining and protecting lawyers' right to legal practice. In the meantime, the All China Lawyers Association and its local branches have all set up lawyers' rights protection centers, accepting and successfully resolving a large number of complaints filed by lawyers. Since March 2017, the rights protection centers of local lawyers' associations across the country have accepted a total of 432 applications for rights protection made by lawyers. So far, 169 cases are being handled, and 265 cases have been successfully resolved. So the centers have played a positive role in maintaining the legal right of lawyers to legal practice. that some particular lawyers have been, punished, have been punished by the Chinese government and judicial authorities in accordance with the law is because their behaviors violated the laws of professional ethics and practice disciplines and went beyond the law-based scope for lawyers' legal practice. And these lawyers even committed crimes. Anyone who violates the law or commits crimes shall be investigated and punished in accordance with the law. No country will allow any people to engage in illegal and criminal activities because they're in the capacity of lawyers. 
Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to the Supreme People's Procuratorate, Mr. Zhou Huiyong, to answer questions. To answer Mr. Marugan's question about the allegations of excessive use of force, torture, arbitrary detention, and disappearance of ethnic minorities. These so-called allegations are not factual. The Chinese government has consistently adhered to the principles of ethnic equality, ethnic solidarity, and common prosperity <coughs> and development of all ethnic groups. The Chinese judicial and law enforcement authorities conscientiously implement China's ethnic policies, strictly enforce legal provisions and regulations, treat all ethnic groups on an equal footing in justice in law enforcement, fully protect the legal rights and interests of suspected criminals, and are always strictly committed to just and civilized law enforcement. There is no so-called excessive use of force, arbitrary detention, and torture. As for the specific case mentioned in the 2017 concluding observations of the Committee Against the Torture, the Chinese government stated its position to the CAD at that time. The argument that Tashi Wanchuk was sentenced for his comments on the protection of ethnic minority languages is not factual. Tashi Wanchuk was arrested on suspicion of inciting the succession of the state by the People's Procuratorate of Yushu Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. On 22nd May 2018, the Intermediate People's Court of Yushu Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture ruled the case and sentenced the, and sentenced the defendant to five years in prison for inciting the succession of the state and deprived of his political rights for five years. The trial of the Tashi Wanchuk case by the Chinese judiciary was handled in strict accordance with the law and in an impartial and independent manner, during which his litigation rights were fully guaranteed. In the course of the trial, in addition to Tashi Wanchuk's exercise of his right to defense, his defense lawyers also fully expressed their defense opinions. Throughout the whole process, the two lawyers of Tashi Wanchuk met with him at the detention center twice upon their own initiative. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Huliang from the United Work Front. Thank you. Some members raised questions concerning China's Xinjiang uh, Weiwar Autonomous Region. Um, first, some general comments. The Xinjiang Weiwar Autonomous Region always respects and guarantees the human rights of people of all ethnic groups and protects the freedom rights of citizens of all ethnic groups according to the law and on an equal footing. Xinjiang citizens, including the Weiwars, equal enjoy equal freedom and rights. The freedom and dignity, economic and social rights, civil and political rights, and other rights of all the ethnic groups are fully guaranteed by law and practice. People of all ethnic groups live and work in peace and contentment, and the freedom of religious belief is fully guaranteed. There is no arbitrary detention 
or lack of freedom of religious belief. Uh, the so-called uh, Xinjiang is a no-rest zone. It's completely uh, against the fact. There are no such things as re-education centers. It must be pointed out that Xinjiang is a victim of terrorism in an effort to secure the life and property of all ethnic groups in the region. Xinjiang Weber Autonomous Region has taken has undertaken a special campaigns campaigns to crack down on violent terrorist activities according to law and put on trial and imprisoned a number of criminals involved in severe offenses in accordance with the law. With respect to criminals involved only in minor offenses, the authority provides them with assistance and education by assigning them to vocational education and employment training centers to acquire employment skills and legal knowledge with a view to assisting in their rehabilitation and reintegration. The legal rights of the offenders assigned to vocational education and employment training centers are duly protected and are not subject to any arbitrary detention, let alone ill treatment there. The argument that a million Uyghurs are detained in re-education centers is completely untrue. On the freedom of religious belief, Xinjiang guarantees citizens' freedom of religious belief in accordance with the law and protects normal religious activities. Xinjiang, as an autonomous region of ethnic minorities, is entitled to formulate local regulations in light of local conditions. Xinjiang is firmly committed to combating terrorism, extremism, and separatism and opposes linking anti-terrorism, anti-extremism, and anti-succession to specific ethnic groups or religions. Neither the revision of religious affairs regulations by the state nor the formulation of the national security law, the anti-terrorism law, and the cyber security law, nor the revision of religious affairs regulations in Xinjiang is to violate the freedom of religious belief Rather, all of these are to better protect the freedom of religious belief of believers. There is neither deliberate targeting at a particular ethnic minority, nor suppressing or restricting the rights or the freedom of religious belief of the Uyghur people. In particular, I would like to emphasize that what should be emphasized uh, is that the regulations on anti-extremism of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, which is enacted there, targets at religious extremism, not any certain religion. There is no de-Islamization, and there is no suppression of ethnic minorities or violations of the freedom of religious belief in the name of counter-terrorism. China is a country of rule of law in which religions are separated from state power. It is not allowed to use religion to interfere with administration, justice, education, or marriage. And it is not allowed to use religion to impede normal social order, work order, or life order. Masked robes are not Xinjiang ethnic costumes. Wearing mask robes is prohibited in accordance with local laws and regulations in Xinjiang. Wearing masked, uh, masked robes is, pro is also prohibited in many other, con many other countries in the world. Uh, this prohibition is not only the need to respect and protect ethnic customs in Xinjiang, but also the need for anti-terrorism and anti-extremism. Since the inception of the regulations on anti-extremism of the Xinjiang um, Uyghur Autonomous Region, the religious believers 
have improved their ability to identify and resist extremist ideology and therefore taken the initiative to reject the influence of extremism. Religious groups and individuals actively incorporate patriotism, peace, solidarity, tolerance, and good deeds, etc., in religious activities to guide the religious believers to believe in what is right. Extremist and terrorist crimes have been clamped down in accordance with the law effectively containing the spread of extremism in Xinjiang. On anti-terrorism and social management measures, Xinjiang has seen much presence of the three forces. Since the 1990s, the three forces at home and abroad have planned and organized a series of violent terrorist incidents such as explosions, assassination, poisoning, arson, assault, turmoil, and riots, which have caused extremely serious lives and property losses for the people of all ethnic groups. At the same time, the three forces attempted to incite extremism and terrorism through various channels and platforms to undermine the stability of Xinjiang. Therefore, the Xinjiang Weiwer Autonomous Region, in light of its reality and in accordance with the law, adopted measures to strengthen social and security management, collected relevant data or information, cracked down on the illegal and criminal activity, activities of the three, three forces, prevented and combated the threat, the threat, the spread of terrorist and extremist audios and videos, and effectively protected the social stability and citizen safety and security, which have won great support of people of all ethnic groups. Xinjiang is committed to opening to the outside world, has a large number of personnel, entries, and access. In Xinjiang's external exchanges, there's also much presence of the three forces at home and abroad. The three forces at home and abroad tend to seize opportunities to collude with each other, to organize terrorists and extremists, to sneak in and out of China for sabotage activities, jeopardizing the social stability there and undermining China's security. Therefore, Xinjiang strictly enforces relevant management measures in accordance with the law and firmly prevents the entry of foreign terrorists and extremists and exit of internal terrorists and extremists. At the same time, Xinjiang protects the legal rights and interests of personnel entering and exiting China in accordance with the law and facilitate the entry and exit of law-abiding personnel. For example, Concerning passport management, the passport law of the People's Republic of China and the Exit and Entry Administration law of the PRC have detailed provisions on citizens' application for passports and legal entry and exit. As an autonomous region of China, Xinjiang has a right to formulate some requirements and regulations in line with the actual conditions of the region in accordance with the law of the PRC on regional ethnic autonomy and the passport law of PRC and has a right to strengthen management in accordance with law. It should be stressed that the Chinese government never links terrorism with any specific ethnic group or religion. The Chinese government attaches great importance to the protection of the freedom and legal rights of citizens of all ethnic groups on an equal footing in counterterrorism, stability maintenance, and law enforcement. There is no contradiction between combating the three forces and prohibiting racial discrimination. On the repatriation of illegally exiting personnel, the East Tur Turkestan separatist forces and personnel outside China have planned and implemented a series of violent terrorist and incitement activities aimed at separating Xinjiang, which seriously jeopardizes the lives and property security of the people of all ethnic groups and social stability of China. China's law enforcement agencies, in accordance with law, strictly carry out international law enforcement cooperation with relevant countries, submit evidence of crimes, conduct repatriation work in a steady and an orderly manner and deal with repatriated illegally exiting personnel in a corresponding manner. 
Those who are deceived by religious extremism and those forced to exit shall be assisted through resettlement and education. Those suspected of leaving the country to participate in terrorist organizations or those criminals at large shall be punished in accordance with the law. For the repatriated personnel, Xinjiang guarantees their legal rights. There is no torture, persecution, or disappearance of the repatriated personnel. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Kasser Abdul Kozhe from Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Dear members, I'm most pleased to have the opportunity to come and talk about the situation in Xinjiang. Since ancient times, Xinjiang is an inseparable part of China. It is a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religion, multicultural area with a lot of exchange. It is also a core area of the Silk Road. I'm an ethnic Tibetan. I am uh, a deputy to the 13th uh, meeting. Like all the people in China, I am fully aware that without the unity of all ethnic groups, then there is no social stability in Xinjiang. And without stability, there's um, a thing possible to do anything. In recent years, there is a prosperity and stability in Xinjiang. Economic development is proceeding uh, at a fast pace. Um, there's progress in all areas of social life, and people's contentment with life is improving. Let me give an example. In 2018, that is in the first part of 2018, there are 55,000 uh, graduates from university who uh, found employment. For families with a zero employment, they enjoy 24-hour uh, government uh, assistance in settlement and employment. The stable uh, situation has attracted a lot of tourists. In 2017, in the whole region, there, there are over um, 107 million uh, tourists. In 2016, compared with 2016, there's an increase of 32 0.4%. In Kach and other places, the increase rate is almost 70%. This year, visitors to Xinjiang have increased greatly. I'm in the profession of medical education, and I'm following the following figures. The death rate in Xinjiang decreased from 20.8 per thousand to uh, 24.8, and uh, the death uh, mortality rate uh, decreased greatly as well, and uh, infant mortality rate uh, decreased uh, to uh, 11 per thousand, and the life expectancy increased from 30 to uh, 72 years old. In Xinjiang, per 10,000 uh, people, there are 63 hospital beds and uh, 21 doctors, uh, higher than the national level. In 2016, people every year can enjoy uh, free medical care and nine year Compulsory education are covered, and 90% uh, of uh, children are in school, and 12-year basic education are fully covered. And these visible and tangible changes have brought benefits to everyone. And they are also what ordinary people value from 1978 to 2017, the number of people in poverty in Xinjiang decreased from 5.32 million to 1 million, 4,000 and 34,000. Our goal is to achieve total poverty alleviation by 2020. 
And uh, poverty alleviation through education is a fundamental policy for the long-term development of ethnic regions. Since 2014, Xinjiang has started to implement free high school education in southern Xinjiang. It has taken the lead in achieving free education in high school in the country. In December 2017, the entire Xinjiang realized 15 years of free education from kindergarten to high school. Today, Xinjiang enjoys social security. Its people live and work in peace and contentment. Its economic development is flourishing. All ethnic groups enjoy heart-to-heart -heart solidarity, and the human rights of citizens of all ethnic groups are fully guaranteed. And um, you can see for yourself uh, and I'd like to invite all of you to the beautiful Xinjiang to see our magnificent uh, scenery, customs, and to feel the true Xinjiang. Thank you. Next, uh, I give the floor to Mr. Roden. He's from the Tibetan Autonomous Region. To answer Mr. Kali Zai's question on Tibet, Mr. Kali Zai. I'm ethnic Tibetan, born and raised in Lhasa. My parents are also Tibetan. I have been working in Lhasa and living in Lhasa for a long time. And please allow me to answer your question as a citizen of the Lhasa city. I can guarantee to you that what I will provide is seen, heard, and experienced by myself. Let me tell you in a responsible manner that t today's Tibet enjoys sound and rapid growth, ever increasing living standards, improving eco environment, progress and unity shared by all ethnic groups and harmonious religious lives and social law and order and happiness enjoyed by all people. As for your questions, mainly focused on the religious freedom of the Tibetans and uh, protection of Tibetan traditional culture, I will give you answers uh, from the following aspects. There are various religious uh, coexisting, coexisting in Tibet, including Tibetan Buddhism, Islam, and Catholicism. There are about 1,787 religious sites where religious activities are carried out and 46,000 registered monks and nuns. Large-scale religious activities like Kora around holy mountains and rivers, Sagadova festival, Buddha painting displays um, are protected and inherited. Last Saturday was the opening day of a Shorten festival in Lhasa which was opened officially. This festival is included in the National Intangible Culture Heritage List in 2006. Early in the morning, my friends uh, from all walks of life uh, sent me a lot of photos taken in a Prujang monastery where the huge Buddha painting was displayed. They were very delighted to see that the activity was in perfect order, the atmosphere was good, and they told me that they're going to a Lobolinka Park and the Zumbia Luka Park to watch the performance of Tibetan opera. In the following days, there will be uh, 10 cultural activities like a horsemanship performance, a traditional Tibetan costumes exhibition, taking place in Lhasa City during the week-long week Shorten Festival. Last month, the Tibetan Socialism College, where I work, and the Provincial Cultural Department of the Tibet Autonomous Region co-organized a training class for the Tibetan inheritors of intangible cultural heritage for further studies of policies, laws, and professional knowledge, we invited experts and scholars to give them training on cultural industry. 
the protection of intangible cultural heritage and uh, ecological protection so that uh, they can develop uh, in on a larger scale members of the committee there is a tibetan saying tibagele which means uh, in mandarin bai wen bu ru yijian and in english seeing in is believing in August 2014, more than 30 experts, scholars, and officials from various countries and regions arrived in Lhasa to witness the dramatic changes taking place in Tibetan Autonomous Region to see for themselves um, the huge changes in interacting with them. Amazing was the most frequently word spoken by them. Mr. George from Greece had never visited Tibet before, and he told me, Tibetan people are living happily, and there are temples and monks everywhere. I can tell that the Chinese government has taken good care of Tibetan religions and culture. And it was Mr. Ram's third visit to Tibet, and he is the president of a Hindu news group. He commented the Tibetan Autonomous Region is undergoing rapid and sustained growth under socialism, which brings benefit to over 3 million local people and Tibetan economy is on the rise. Over the past two decades, the economy there has maintained a two-digit growth, enabling huge changes in Tibet. And long gone are the days when Tibet was secluded thanks to the tremendous development there. The forum was held under the theme of uh, opportunities and choices uh, for the development in Tibet, China. And uh, three sub-forums were themed sustainable development of Tibet, inheritance and protection of Tibetan culture, and ecological and environmental protection in Tibet, respectively. We were glad to have received so many valuable suggestions from the attendants members of the committee, I hope you could visit Tibet someday and see for yourself and uh, offer your valuable recommendations for the development of Tibet. Thank you. Thank you. I know that the time uh, goes uh, passes uh, fast, and uh, last Friday, um, questions were asked on um, media health, uh, NGOs, uh, household registration in urban and rural areas, etc. Due to lack of time, we have uh, written documents uh, for you, and we will not uh, take up your time in uh, reading them. Before coming to Geneva, we also received your written list of themes. Some of the questions were not touched during our dialogue last Friday, but we also prepared written answers. You have received them already. Uh, we have provided you with a large amount of information and uh, numerous documents. We hope that you will read them. Thank you. So, without further ado, I would like to give the floor back to the delegation.
Oh, but Mr. I thought we were going to have the responses from Hong Kong and Macau. Or? We could have the responses from Hong Kong and Macau, um, and they want another 20 minutes. So perhaps we could listen to them afterwards, either now or afterwards. We want to do it now? OK, then we'll do it now. OK. In that case, we'll do Macau and Hong Kong now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rapporteur. Now I give the floor to Mr. Chen Shui-Fu from Hong Kong SAR for the reply. Chair, distinguished chairman and members, good morning. Thank you for the question put to us before the hearing and at the last section on Friday. Um, as well, Hong Kong has provided written responses, and the response is now tabled at the meeting. What I'm going to do now is to give some highlights. Hong Kong is a multicultural city where persons of diverse backgrounds live harmoniously. The Hong Kong SAR government attached great importance to promoting social and racial harmony amongst different groups of people in the city and is committed to promoting, through measures legislative or otherwise, the core values, such as mutual respect for people from different backgrounds in the community and equality for all. A steering committee chaired by the Chief Secretary for Administration has already been set up earlier this year to coordinate, review, and monitor support for ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, and a sum of 500 million has been earmarked in our budget to strengthen the support services. Human rights are fully protected by law in the Hong Kong SAL and are enshrined in the basic law. The Hong Kong Bills of Rights Ordinance and other relevant legislation. These are buttressed by the rule of law and an independent judiciary. There's also an existing institutional framework of statutory organization which help promote and safeguard various rights, including the EOC, Equal Opportunity Commissions. The Hong Kong government performance in promoting and safeguarding human rights is open to public scrutiny through regular reports to the United Nations, as what we are doing now, and is under the scrutiny of our Legislative Council, the media, and various NGOs. The Hong Kong SAR government considered that the existing mechanism has worked well and that there's no need to establish an additional human rights institution which would duplicate the function and work of the existing mechanism. In response to the point raised by Mr. Morgan on the Equal Opportunities Commission, I would like to report that although the Paris principles are not set out in an international convention, the EOC largely follows the Paris Principles in terms of independence, autonomy, pluralism, powers of investigation, resources, and powers to take legal action. The EOC is an inter independent statutory body. Its power, functions, and autonomy in internal governance are protected by law. Members of the EOC comprise representatives with different expertise and from various sectors. Responding to another point raised up by Mr. Morgan on the race discrimination ordinance, I would like to report that the ordinance binds the government and therefore prohibits discriminatory acts and practices of the government and other public authorities in all the areas specified in the ordinance, such as employment, education, provision of goods services and facilities, and the disposal or management of premises. In particular, Section 27 of the ordinance render it unlawful for the Hong Kong SL government to discriminate against a person 
in the provision of services of any department or any undertaking by or of the Hong Kong SAL government. But I would also like to point out that the EOC has put forward 27 priority recommendations on reviewing our discrimination ordinances, including the racial discrimination ordinance. As I reported on Friday at last session, we will introduce legislative amendments by the end of this year to take forward eight of these recommend, uh, priority recommendations, of which, of which six related to racial discrimination ordinance. As to the remaining recommendation, which covers, amongst other things, government function and power in relation to the scope of the racial discrimination ordinance, the government will continue to carefully study the outstanding recommendation and consider how to follow up on them at a later stage while maintaining communication with the EOC. In any event, under the Hong Kong SAL legal framework, public bodies have always been prohibited from practicing racial discrimination. The Hong Kong Bills of Rights Ordinance prohibits the Hong Kong SAL government and public authorities from engaging in practices that would entail any form of discrimination, including racial, discri racial discrimination. Avenues are also available to address complaints against public authorities through the ombudsman, complaint channels in uh, regular bureaus and departments, and the legislat legislative council, etc. Mr. Chairman and members, uh, at the Friday section, quite a number of questions were also put to us on a number of issues such as education, labor rights, and some um, human trafficking issues, including some non refoulement claimant issues. All the questions are fully addressed in our written responses. In the interest of time, I would suggest that we do not read them out unless a member asks us to now. So without further ado, Chairman, I, I would like to end my report here. Thank you very much. Let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Liu Dexia from uh, Macau SAR to uh, speak. Honorable Chairperson, distinguished members of the committee, to start, please allow me to express my appreciation for the excellent work of the committee's rapporteur and the co-rapporteurs. Due to the time constraint, I will endeavor to provide answers to the questions addressed to the Macau SAR in a comprehensive and summary manner. However, the detailed answers in relation to the relevant questions raised by the committee can be referred to the respective paragraphs of our written reply to the list of themes at a later stage. Uh, I will first address the question raised by Mr. Madrogan, the rapporteur, which is related to the recommendation to set up a national human rights institution in line with the Paris Principle in Macau SAR. The Commission Against Corruption is an independent and autonomous authority with criminal investigation powers to counter corruption in the region, and meanwhile, with an ombudsman's function, namely to promote and protect rights and freedoms, to safeguard the interests of individuals, and to ensure that the exercise of public power abides by the criteria of justice, legality, and efficiency. It should be stressed that the commissioner is appointed by the chief executive in his capacity as the head of the region under the Articles 45 and 59 of the Basic Law of the Macau SAR, with no association to his executive powers established in Articles 61 and 60 to 66 of the Basic Law of the Marca SAR. Therefore, he exercises his ombudsman functions with total independence and is only bound by the law without subject to any administrative or executive authority or any other forms of constraint. In addition, the Commissioner maintains ties with the ombudsman with other countries and regions, being a member of the International Ombudsman Institute and the Asian Ombudsman Association. The full independence 
autonomy, powers, and mandate of the Commission against corruption are therefore consistent with the Paris principles. For more detailed information in relation to this issue, please refer to paragraphs 1 to 7 of our written reply to the list of themes. Regarding the question of Ms. Marugan as to the interaction with the NGOs as regards work and cooperation, the Macau SAR government has been working closely with the NGOs in public affairs and actively encouraging NGOs to participate in the institutions involved in human rights affairs created by the government, including the Council for Social Affairs, the Commission on the Fight Against AIDS, Mental Health Commission, and many other numerous commissions, which I won't list them due to constraint of time. The NGO's participation guarantees the transparency of the allocation of public resources and the service in detail and to encourage NGOs to participate in government affairs. For more detailed information in this regard, please refer to paragraphs 7 to 9 of our written reply to the list of themes. As regards the request made by Mr. Marogan to provide the con content of criminal law provisions related to racial discrimination, please refer to paragraphs 30 to 35 of, of our written reply to the list of themes. In relation to le legislation on hate, speech, it should be noted that although freedom of expression is explicitly safeguarded under Article 27 of the Basic Law and under Ordinary Law, prohibition of the dissemination of racism, incitement to racial discrimination, hatred or violence, defamation or injuring a person or groups of persons by reasons of their race, colour or ethnic origin is expressly provided and sanctioned in the criminal law. In law 2 slash 99 slash M, that establishes the regime of the fr freedom of uh, association in the press law and the law governing radio and TV broadcasting. Likewise, candidates are forbidden to incite hatred or violence in the course of their campaigns under Articles 70 and 84 of law 3. Uh, slash 2001, please refer to paragraph of our 35 hour reply to the themes for more information. As regards the request of Mr. Maragan to provide statistical data on complaints, prosecutions, court and administrative decisions related to racial and ethnic discrimination, the judicial organs have not received any complaints and rendered any decision related to racial discrimination. Nevertheless, the supervisory entities, namely the CCAC, the Commission for Disciplinary Control of the Security Forces and Services of Marca and Labor Affairs Bureau, received several complaints. The related statistical uh, data can be found in paragraphs 18 to 21, 22, and 36 of our written reply to the list of themes. Regarding the concern raised by Mr. Marogan on the non-existence of court cases related to racial and ethnic discrimination claims, the Macau SAR government believes that this is due to the historical and cultural background and cultural diversity of the Macau SAR and the dis dissemination of anti-bias behaviour and respect for cultural differences, customs, traditions and tolerance, which are deeply rooted in the society. Apart, <clears throat> apart from being safeguarded by law. Another important element to point out is that significant efforts have been made to disseminate human rights legislation and in particular the labour legislation considering the number of non-resident workers in the region as well as access to free legal aid in cases of insufficient financial capacity. The new law on the legal aid system guarantees access to court proceedings to all, including foreign workers, foreign students, holders of refugee status and holders of special permits to stay. and they can all resort to court proceedings to protect their own rights and interests. In relation to the question raised by the Honourable Rapporteur related to the entities that undertake labour supervision and inspection, in the Macau SAR, the Labour Affairs Bureau has been proactively carrying out labour inspection actions at different workplaces, monitoring the compliance with labour law by employers and workers, as well as providing explanatory sessions disseminating labour legislation 
under the complaint and redress mechanisms available in cases of violation. Relevant information and actions taken by the government on this matter, including directly targeted on foreign and ethnic minority workers, have been extensively addressed in paragraphs 36, 38 to 39, 46 to 55, 75 to 77, 78 to 86, and 75 to 89 of our written reply. Still within this context concerning the ILO conventions, please note that the ILO conventions number 29, 81, and 105 are already applicable to the Markov SAR. In respect to questions concerning human trafficking, it should be stressed that the call international conventions are applicable to the Macau SAR, namely the Protocol to the Palermo Convention, the ILO Convention Number 182, the additional Protocol to the Convention on the Rights of Child and the Sale of Children, uh, Child Prosti Prostitution, ch Child Pornography. In addition, with the adoption of Law 6-2008 that criminalizes auto autonomously trafficking in persons and establishes a comprehensive victim assistance and protection regime should be underlined. The crime of human trafficking in this law covers all the elements and purposes of the crime prescribed in the Palermo Protocol and the law broadens its scope to include human trafficking for the sale of tissues and organs. Extraterritorial jurisdiction and criminal liability of legal persons were established and a comprehensive and integrated victim assistance mechanism has been introduced and the commission to follow up the implementation of dissuasive measures against trafficking in persons has been established under the supervision of the Secretary for Security to ensure interdepartmental coordination and effective collaboration. Due to time constraint, I will uh, highlight the following. In relation to the questions raised by Ms. Shepherd, the Honourable Co-Rapporteur on education and particularly access of children to, of ethnic minorities to education, policies to guarantee bilingual education, including to ensure Cantonese as teaching language at schools to, in, to ensure social integration and policies to ensure proficiency in languages by students, it should be reiterated that ethnic minorities are not segregated from education in the Macau SAR. The Macau SAR government has no policies of central allocation of schools. Students are free to choose the school of their own choice and schools can admit students freely. As for the details, I will not uh, go cover them uh, one by one here. Uh, other questions related to education are also covered uh, briefly in my written reply. In addition to the, the other questions are by members who, which restrict the ethnic minorities to uh, have housing, these questions are also uh, covered in my written reply. Please refer to my written replies. Uh, Honourable, Honourable Chairman and distinguished members of, of the committee, uh, the above is my summarised answer to the question put forward last Friday. I hope I have met your expectation. The Macau SAR government attaches great importance to the work performed by this committee and is fully committed to keep improving its human rights legal system in the region. Thank you very much for your attention. I myself would like to thank you. Mr. Marigan, you have the floor, followed up by Ms. McDougall and then Ms. Shepherd. Therefore, Mr. Marigan, you have the floor. <coughs> Thanks, Chair, for, for giving me the floor. I would like to, to thank the Chinese delegation for the responses to our questions and comments. Both the answers have been both written and in English and oral. The information we have received in a written form is, I think it's for a dialogue of at least 20 hours. And we're not going to have 20 hours. And, but thank you so much for the one, two, three, four, five, I think it's five documents I have in my table. Thank you so much for such an immense work you have done in, during the weekend. 
let's see how we can try to have this dialogue. I uh, want to thank you for your answers. I will focus on those issues that I understand have not been answered or that I have doubts about the responses, but I want to, to highlight that I really thank about all the information that we, you have given to us and in English. I will also try to leave space for my colleagues because I have a lot of questions, but we only, I think, have about an hour left, so, and for you to have time for maybe get answered to specific questions. I will try to be very brief and direct to the point, so please don't see me as impolite if I go very straight to the points and try to be very focused. It's for leaving time for my colleagues and so that we can have an, an interactive dialogue. That's it, what we usually have. Thank you. On the Human Rights Action Plan that you answered, I didn't see any answer on the budgeting and resource allocation and the impact of financial resources appropriated by different administrative levels. I asked, as you all answered, on the efforts on, on China, um, Macau, China, to establish national human rights institutions fully compliant with the Paris Principles, and also to the Equal Opportunities Commission in Hong Kong, China, compliant with the Paris Principles. And I see from your answers that there is no move forward, as I thought all the treaty bodies asked have done, and I asked answer on Friday. Uh, I mean, maybe I, I missed some of the, all your, the information you gave us, but I don't see any, any move forward on to be compliant with the Paris principles. I mean, in China, you talk about the different ministries, and I think you said also in, a, in the um, Economic, Social, and, and Cultural Rights Commission, but um, I don't see a, any will to establish national human rights fully compliant with the Paris principles neither a move forward in Hong Kong, China, or in uh, Macau, China. On the uh, government's view on how the collaboration with NGO could improve that I asked on Friday, I also don't see um, a positive response. I asked that you stated on paragraph four that you had uh, the direct participations of NGOs on the drafting of the report, but I asked how many meetings and with which NGOs, but I don't see the answer. I also said that before the, um, the two laws that have been drafted, before the, uh, the NGO international management law, there were 7,000 overseas NGOs. And now the, the number I have provided by civil society that it's there are only five registered NGOs who do work with ethnic minorities and none of them of, on ethnic racial discrimination. So uh, do you have any statistics on how NGOs on, on the fight against racial discrimination are working in China? How is your work to, to, to improve the work with them and, and for them to have it easier? Because I, I, I see on the registration uh, burdens or the registration, uh, I understand, for security reasons or for whatever reasons you're asking them, but I don't see how you're working them, with them in order for the work to be improved and so there could be a collaboration with them. I don't see that. Um, uh, in your responses, you say that ethnic discrimination is prohibited under Chinese law, but the, the laws you talk about in the report are silent on what type of action and behavior would constitute discrimination. I'm glad, and I thank you for that, that you recognize the need to strengthen the implementation of the anti-discrimination provisions and improve the anti-discrimination contents in specific laws. So I understand you want to do an, an, a, a move forward there in China, uh, so will you propose a comprehensive anti-discrimination law? You talk about reforming and changing different laws in your, in your written answers, but will you propose a comprehensive anti-discrimination law? Because I, I, I think I see a move forward there from China, and I think that would be really good if, if you move forward there. But I, I don't uh, think I see any, that you provide any statistics on acts of racial discrimination, or any survey, any statistics, any administrative record or registers of any kind, in the, uh, in the areas of employment, of education, of housing, of healthcare, any civil labor uh, or any other uh, in the courts, any administrative body, any survey. I mean, I don't see how, if administrative, uh, if, if discrimination, of racial discrimination of co occurs, I don't know, I don't see any statistics of how you follow up on that. Um, and I think that could give politicians a lot of information and would also give us the committee uh, a lot of information in order to understand your reality and help you with your progress. But I don't see in your answers that you have those statistics. On Macau, China, uh, I don't see Macau has a domestic law specifically defining and criminalizing racial discrimination in line with Article 1 and Article 4 of the Convention. And I don't see in Macau during the reported period that the courts, 
did not receive any cases relating to racial discrimination, and the five related complaints filed before the Commission Against Corruption in Macau, China, I think, were considered to be unsubstantiated. I thank you for your answer to my question on how does China ensure that laws on, uh, and policies aimed at counterterrorism, separatism, or extremism do not undermine the, not, the non-discrimination provisions of the Convention and those contained in the Constitution and the law on regional national autonomy protecting members of ethnic minorities. I understand, I have read that the concept of separatism is not clearly defined in Chinese law. In practice, it covers a large variety of activities I've read. We have received information that states that Tibetans were prosecuted on the charge of separatism or inciting separatism, but sometimes it was for the peaceful exercise of their human rights. We have received information that states that Uyghurs and other predominantly Muslim ethnic minorities in the Shangar Uyghur Autonomous Region have long suffered violation of their rights, including the rights to freedom of religion and belief, association, opinion, expression, and to information. We have received information that states that the Shuar authorities have ascribed numerous violent incidents which occurred in the Shuar or other regions in China to Uyghur individuals and have used this to just justify a heavy-handed response against Uyghurs and other predominantly Muslim ethnic minorities in the Shuar. Sorry. We have received information that states that Tibetans and Uyghurs, human rights defenders, are overwhelmingly charged with the crimes of inciting separatism, terrorism, and endangering state security. I don't see in your answers the explanation on how procedures are in line with the Convention and protect them from abuses that infringe the Convention. On racist hate speech and hate crimes, Thanks for providing the content of Articles 249, 250, and 251 of the Chinese Criminal Code. Uh, but I don't see you have any statistics on hate crimes. I, I asked if you recognize under reporting of hate crimes in China, in Hong Kong, China, and in Macau, China. I don't see any statistics in, in neither of them. Uh, what have you done to support victims of racial discrimination in reporting their complaints? How do you help them? I don't see any responses in China, Hong Kong, China, or Macau, China. And I don't see how, how I asked on Friday, and how have you verified as the committee that the scarcity of such complaints, because you talk about two or three complaints you explain in your report, but no more than that. And, and that how have you verified that the scarcity of such complaints is not the result of lack of effective remedies, enabling victims to seek redress, victims' lack of awareness of their rights, fear of reprisals, lack of confidence in the police and the judicial authorities, or lack of attention or sensitivity to cases of racial discrimination on the part of the authorities as the committee recommended in 2009. I understand that there are reports in Hong Kong, China, of inflammatory public statements against certain, certain ethnic minorities, in particular South Asians, by politicians. I understand the last election, there were quite some of them. Reports also indicate that appropriate action is often not taken by the authorities in response to such statements, to such incidents. There are also reports that hate crimes and acts of hate speech have been committed against ethnic Mongolians in China and have not resulted in criminal charges against the perpetrators. Okay. I'm, I, there's another issue, and I, I'm sorry for the Chinese delegation. No? Okay. But I didn't raise that in this in Friday. I'm sorry to raise it now. It's just a very quick issue. I'm, I'm asking China if, if there's any intention to remove the two reservations you have to ICERD, the reservation that Hong Kong China has to Article 6 on the Convention, and the reservations made by the State Party, Hong Kong China and Macau China, to Article 22 of the Convention. On poverty, thanks so much for your answers. I understand that in Macau China, despite lower official poverty rates, Reports estimate that poverty rates in Macau, China, to be around 10%, taking into account the, the high cost of living. About resettlement, reports indicate involuntary resettlement of nomadic herds people, including for ethnic autonomous areas into towns where they may face ethnic discrimination and the loss of their traditional livelihoods and communities. Reports we have also indicate that some individuals resisting resettlement have been subjected to harassment, violence, and imprisonment. We have also re received reports, yes, I'm finishing, indicated that many Tibetans have been involuntarily resettled 
from their land? On torture, I don't see answers to the specific questions I raised on torture. Will you impartially and credibly investigate officials implicated in the ill treatment of Tibetans, Uyghurs, and other ethnic minorities and appropriately bring them to justice? How has your government taken steps to prevent torture relating to cases related to national security that affect ethnic minorities? As I said last Friday, we have received information about documented cases in which Tibetans, Uyghurs, and other ethnic minorities have been tortured or otherwise ill treated. We have received information that states that it is not uncommon for Uy Okay. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to return uh, quickly to the matter of uh, 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 definitions in uh, the laws involving national security. Um, and um, let me just say that to say that they don't violate the, the rights of, of minorities or detainees does not prove anything. It, we have to have more than a denial of the allegations. Um, I uh, heard a flat denial of the allegation uh, about detentions uh, in uh, uh, the Uyghur uh, uh, area, but I didn't hear, you said I was false on the million. Well, how, how many were there? Please tell me. Um, and what were the, the laws on which they were uh, detained, the specific uh, provisions? Uh, you say that these laws have um, uh, uh, required that investigations must be carried out. Well, can I see or can we see some of those investigation reports? That would be uh, very uh, useful. Uh, so we still don't know. Uh, I, I, I think that I am not convinced about the numbers uh, in the uh, detention uh, camps and the numbers in the re-education uh, uh, camps. Um, I noticed that you didn't quite deny that these re-education or indoctrination uh, programs uh, don't take place. You said something a little bit uh, not uh, a full denial. Uh, but I understand that in terms of the laws, uh, you know, lawyers tell us that they uh, have uh, clients that are not, um, not permitted to uh, plead not guilty uh, under certain uh, charges. Um, I understand that uh, if um, somebody is uh, being uh, held on terrorism, uh, separation, separatism, or national security, uh, there is no uh, database about how many uh, verdicts there were. Um, that, that information is classified as a state secret. Uh, I don't call that, uh, uh, you know, transparency. Um, I also want to raise the issue of the uh, Ihan Toti, who is a scholar given for a life sentence uh, for making some statements uh, that uh, were uh, called separatist statements. And Madam Shepherd, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the delegation from China for working over time to provide answers to our uh, numerous questions posed on Friday and for documenting these answers, well, some of them anyway. Thanks for clarifying and expanding on the concerns on education that we raised and you have reinforced your commitment to bilingual education and respecting the cultures of the multiple ethnicities in your country. And of course, we saw this already in the various documents you submitted to us. Now, there are clearly differences in information to which the committee has access and differences in, in opinion and interpretation, and the committee will have to find a way to resolve these divergences. But I will ask, though, how do you monitor the implementation of your educational policies? And how do you 
um, evaluate the impact on the receiving population. Because articulating and writing policies, that's one thing. Um, monitoring the impact is quite another thing. How do you plan to accelerate the teaching of Chinese in Hong Kong, for example, so that non-Chinese speaking students and teachers can be integrated to avoid socioeconomic marginalization and segregation? And these are clearly taking place. And by the way, I consider the need for integration commendable because it is always a challenge for multi-ethnic societies to push social integration. But how will you ensure, for example, that parents are fully advised about um, where to send their children and monitor teachers who, from the complaints we have received, are really not adequately prepared and resourced to implement your laudable policies? Um, uh, two other things. My question read the content of history education has not been fully answered. So I repeat the need to know how a discipline that it has the potential to either uh, unite or divide is treated in all education institutions. And I'm happy to hear that the decade for people of African descent will have an action plan, but I'm yet to hear from the state party the content of such action plan. And Finally, to end, Chair and Head of Delegation, you know, Hong Kong and Macau, for example, because of their histories of distinctive identities manifested in their language, languages, their ethnicities, and their cultures. And within this context, achieving unity in diversity poses challenges for the Chinese state. But if there is merit in diversity, and if you agree to that, all ethnicities have to be given the opportunity to progress and enjoy all the rights and, um, guaranteed in your constitution and in the ICERD. They have to have equal opportunities to, to get themselves out of the socioeconomic situation in which some find your, themselves and you have a laudable poverty eradication um, project and process. But the education is one way out of poverty and people have to be given the, the opportunity to ensure that education is fully available in, in their languages and, and in Chinese so that they can really enjoy the rights enshrined in your constitution and in the ICERD. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Head of Delegation. Merci, Madame Shepard. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. We have 50 minutes left, 5-0. We have four people who want to take the floor, Mr. Khalid Zai, Mr. Murillo, Ms. Aftonomov, and um, Ms. Mohammed. Mr. Khalid Zai, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. I should also like to thank the distinguished delegation of China for the extensive and detailed replies that they've given us and the detailed, indeed personalized information that they gave to answer our concerns. It uh, serves to better demonstrate China's situation to us. However, there are some gaps, and I'd like to insist on those in order to better understand how China is implementing our convention. These are questions that we ask to all, that I ask to all states parties to our convention. How many complaints have you received? How many have been brought to trial? How many cases have received sentences? Reading the, inf the report of the Information Technology Center from Massachusetts, it said if, they didn't, if it didn't take drastic measures, China would suffer from uh, damaging environmental effects damaging for the population. And I'm particularly concerned about this, given a couple of projects that you are planning to implement, uh, particularly in Tibet. Could you provide us with detailed information as to how the railway network and planned railway and uh, the Belt Road Initiative through Tibet will ca be carried out in full compliance with the obligations under CERD and without uh, threatening to extinguish the nomadic lifestyle of Tibetan nomads. Could you also provide us information about the land that was confiscated from Tibetan nomads in 1998 in the name of environmental conservation? These have now become tourist areas. 
hydraulic uh, uh, dam projects and other mining projects, and they are clearly harming the uh, the environment in the region. I read an article from Global Times on uh, in July regarding the harm towards students uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, holiday practices, where children's uh, right to worship was was um, quashed in Tibet. This is not in line with Article 5 of our Convention, and in or, nor is it in line with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Those are the few questions that I wanted to ask, Chairman, and my thanks to the delegation in advance. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murillo, please. Thank you, Chairman. I should also like to thank the distinguished delegation of China for all the detailed replies that they have given us this morning. I should like to thank them for their renewed commitment to the outcome of the Durban Conference and the International Decade of People of African Descent. I do hope that the distinguished state party has taken note of the importance of holding the fourth world conference against racism at a time when the international community is facing huge challenges in that area. Two very brief questions for the distinguished delegation of China. I would like you to know either now or in the future if they can provide us information regarding the impact on the issue of racism of the of so-called AI, artificial intelligence. We know that China is a pioneering country in terms of technology, but we've received information to the effect that, that some groups, some communities in particular, are in fact being affected negatively by some practices related to uh, partial identification in particular. So I'd like to know if you have any data on that. Furthermore, as regards the public sector, a huge percentage of the population, and a concern that was expressed to the delegation by Mr. Marugan relates to follow-up and assessment of procedures relating to racial discrimination. It's important to know whether China has considered carrying out inquiries into racial discrimination and racism, and whether this group of the population, the civil servants, whether they undergo online training, for example, bearing in mind the technological advantages in the state party. That was everything, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ftonomov, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, I, I, I won't ask more questions because it's impossible to answer them, So, but I, I dare uh, to make uh, certain uh, comments on this. Uh, I, I noted that uh, health health care provided uh, to anybody on an equal uh, level, regardless of ethnicity. It's important for us, and we just noted this. Uh, I also noted the development of minority languages. Thank you very much for circulation of all these written materials as answers to our questions. I noted as well that um, uh, because of these policies, uh, no language and even version of language was lost in China last year. So the previously uh, only Jurchen uh, language, which was lost several hundreds years ago, uh, but actually all different uh, versions, including uh, including Chinese language as Hakka, uh, Funzhan, uh, and many other uh, kinds of languages, and uh, Cantonese language is still preserved, which is important for us. Well, I, I would like I would like to say also that we're very pleased to have Madam Li among us. And I, note, uh, I, and I would like just to notice that uh, uh, Chinese citizens were always present among members of the committee, 
which is, I think, I think also good advantages, advantage for us. Um, uh, um, uh, but I would like just to finish what I said about uh, Macau. I didn't have enough time just to finish. Um, just to say that um, I noticed that uh, in 2013, Bureau of Legal Affairs uh, organized, um, organized briefings uh, for domestic workers and migrant workers and so on and so forth, dealing with trafficking in and their rights and so on. If there's any uh, similar initiatives organized uh, in um, last years, and I noticed as well that um, a department, uh, 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 labor inspection department uh, of Macau also just can, um, can consider complaints uh, submitted by people. But as far as I know, uh, in the period from uh, 2012 to uh, 2015, only one complaint received. Uh, I, I don't mean that uh, bureau, that the department should go just to find and to look for complaints, but probably it's necessary just to um, provide more information to people to, uh, 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 I mean, just a complaint dealing with discrimination. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, uh, saying very, very rapidly. Um, uh, complaint dealing with discrimination on the basis of race, color, and ethnicity. Only one complaint in the period between 2012 2015. Uh, so one complaint in uh, three years. I don't mean that there is intentional discrimination, but sometimes, uh, you know, in the private sector there might be some kind of a, uh, prejudices and so on and so forth. So from that point of view, uh, it's important to know if there is any kind of, um, uh, some kind of incentives and uh, dissemination of information uh, on the possibilities of uh, the inspection. And a good news as well uh, that uh, in this year there was just a decision by the Macau government to, um, uh, to raise um, fees for their birth, uh, for their birth but, uh, in, uh, just in hospitals. But as far as I know, that it was a decision just dealing with the migrant domestic workers that they decided just to make, um, uh, to make it cheaper than for ordinary public, uh, which is also important for me. And I think it's also good, a good news uh, for us. But Microphone, please. F finishing my sentence. Uh, we're expecting a new dialogues in the future. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur Thank you, Mr. Ftanomov. Ms. Mohammed, you have the floor. Le Président. Thank you, Chairman. I should also like to thank the delegation of China for the replies delivered this morning. My thanks also go to the reporter and co-reporter. On Friday, I asked a number of questions, and I don't seem to have received detailed replies to them, rather cursory replies. Nonetheless, never mind, I have a new question I'd like to ask. The regional government in Uyghur has um, adopted legislation on uh, tar targeting Islam in particular, which is particularly repressive of Islam. We would seek a specific definition of extremism under which Uyghur, the Uyghur were arrested and sentenced. Thank you. Merci, Madame Da. Thank you. Merci, uh, Madame Mohamed. Uh, Madame Diaye, vous avez la parole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the delegation for providing information and again for the handouts in English, which are always very useful. I would like to get back to list the list of themes 32 and 34, just for a few um, additional remarks. As I mentioned on Friday, um, we do understand that at the end of 2008, um, China has drafted a comprehensive refugee law with inputs from all relevant ministries, but it has never been adopted. And I wonder whether you could give us an explanation why, because if so much work has gone into this, it would be good to see what's the follow-up and what will happen with this draft law in the future. I, uh, of course, we welcome the fact that the 2005 law on exit and entry administration 
um, was formulated. However, as I mentioned, um, it still means that China has incorporated only a few provisions of the Refugee Convention and the Protocol. And while I understand that the competent authorities will continue to study and formulate um, legislation governing refugee affairs, um, do you have plans to fill in these urgent loopholes and come up with a roadmap and concrete plans on how to establish a national mechanism for refugee status determination and how to establish um, provisions on who qualifies as a refugee and how an application for refugee status can be made. Now, I noted that you divide the, um, dedicated uh, separate paragraphs to um, people and persons coming from the DPRK, so I would also just reflect on that quickly. I understand that your position is that citizens of DPRK who entered China illegally did it out of economic reasons. On the other hand, as we are aware, the Commission of Inquiry on DPRK disputes this and argues that many of these people flee persecution, in fact, and are therefore entitled to international protection. So my question is, how do we know what is the truth? In the absence of a properly established organization or government body responsible for refugee status determination, in this regard, it would be desirable to establish all the appropriate laws and mechanisms and to extend asylum and other means of durable protection to persons fleeing DPRK who would need international protection and to provide UNHCR and other relevant humanitarian organizations full and impeded access to all persons from DPRK seeking such contacts. I would also have welcomed further information on statelessness, especially on the tens of thousands of children without nationality who cannot access education, healthcare, citizenship, and basic rights, and whose situation is indeed of, deeply con of deep concern to us. Now, as for Hong Kong um, um, SAR, the committee will study your detailed reply carefully. However, it seems a bit concerning to me that the government maintains a firm policy of not determining or recognizing a refugee status of anyone, while also acknowledging that non refoulement claimants can become destitute during their per the presence in Hong Kong. And hence, as a welcome initiative, the government did commission an NGO to offer the needed humanitarian assistance to these persons. And on Macau SCR, um, I would like to just maintain again that it's a good example. This is the only autonomous region where both the Refugee Convention and the Protocol are applicable, and where indeed a Refugees Commission has been established. And I would like to thank for the information you provided in your handouts on the numbers. Thank you very much. Merci, madame. Thank you, Mr. Ndai. You were the last speaker requesting the floor from the committee. We will give the delegation between five and ten minutes to think about the replies to the questions raised. So if we can be back, if we can resume at 12.35, 12.40, just to give the delegation a bit of time to give some preliminary replies. We'll also give the floor to the rapporteur in tasked with follow-up on the committee, and we will conclude our work at one o'clock. So five to ten minutes, please, just in order for China to think about its replies to the questions. Thank you.
Continuons nos travaux. Le temps qui nous est imparti. So, we've only got a very short time left. But on Miss McDougall's request, I shall give her a few minutes before the Chinese delegation speaks again to answer the questions. Uh, Ms. McDougall, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I do, uh, I would like my questions posed yesterday to be uh, answered in detail because they do uh, relate to some lives. Uh, those people in detention, those people in the so-called re-education camps, those students that returned, uh, some voluntarily, others uh, being deported from their host countries, what has happened uh, to them? And I think that we would appreciate a list that uh, includes names and current status. Uh, I also want to ask about this question of representation, uh, because um, I understand that, uh, that uh, minorities uh, hold very few significant uh, positions of influence um, in China and are subject to discriminatory practices. Uh, I understand that Han officials hold the majority of the powerful positions in the Communist Party. And I understand that the chief, um, uh, chief official in the uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region is uh, someone who was put there from uh, Beijing, actually somebody who's not uh, from that region, therefore not uh, Uyghur. So I, I, that makes me question the, uh, the sort of uh, democratic or whatever decision making uh, in uh, that region about things like the uh, regional um, law on uh, religious uh, extremism. Um, it, it makes me question the, the, the character of it being uh, representative of local decision making. Um, so I'd like uh, some comment on that, and I think I've said before, uh, the whole area of the, uh, the, the uh, religious extremism laws um, and the definitions, which was not really uh, answered um, in uh, all of these documents, uh, voluminous documents, you didn't tell us exactly what's the definition of extremism, of uh, separatism, um, uh, of uh, you know the the charges that are uh, the primary uh, against uh, those who uh, have been detained. Um, and again, I want the numbers who's been detained on what. Uh, issues, et cetera. Um, and um, I think that I would also like to ask, Mr. Chairman, uh, that we have some information on the current uh, situation of, uh, of a Uyghur scholar, uh, Ilan I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, but I think you know, who's given a license for separatism uh, for uh, so-called inciting uh, Uyghurs uh, to extremism. Um, and I think that this is somebody that it would uh, show us uh, goodwill <laughs> Thank you. It would be um, a uh, an effort uh, and a gesture of goodwill um, if um, uh, we could understand uh, more about his situation, and uh, we understand that he's ill. Um, and that his situation would be improved if he were moved to Beijing. So I think that's one situation in which you could uh, uh, benefit. Uh, you could uh, show a gesture of goodwill. 
Um, I think that there are some additional issues that uh, that should be that want to be addressed by our co rapporteur, Madam uh, Shepherd. No, no. So thank you. Then. Merci, ma Madame. Ma thank you, Ms. McDougall. We only have a quarter of an hour remaining. So I'd like to ask the interpreters to give us an extra five to 10 minutes of additional time, if that's okay. An extenuating circumstance, given the importance and indeed the size of the Chinese delegation here with us. So I'll now give the floor straight back to the delegation to answer the questions that have just been asked. For five or ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. Our discussion this morning indicates that the committee is highly interested in uh, the situation in China, and apparently the time for review, as mentioned by the rapporteur, and the time for us to exchange is uh, hardly enough. Some members mentioned just now that some of the issues raised by yourselves have not been responded to by the Chinese delegation. But what I would like to point out is that, in fact, that many of those have been responded to. Some of them have been responded uh, to orally. Others are included in our written replies, including the question on the Human Rights Action Plan and the st specific statistics. All these are included in our written replies. Due to time constraint, we haven't read out such statistics, so we hope that the members will have time to read our written replies. Of course, many of the issues concern are theoretical, are practical, and concern statistics. The exchanges or the Q&As and the written replies uh, can hardly cover all of them. So we hope in future we will have opportunities for all types of uh, exchanges, including exchanges in an academic fashion. We also hope the uh, members can make field visits to China to us help the members to understand comprehensively the implementation of the convention by China. Let me share a few points with you from now. First, to promote unity amongst nationalities and the joint development and prosperity and to defend the rights of the ethnic minorities are the consistent objectives of the Chinese government and are in the fundamental interests of all the Chinese people. On this issue, there is not an issue of external pressure. This is something that we need to do ourselves. For this reason, the Chinese government has made huge amount of re input in terms of resources and in terms of effort. Uh, we should say that the development in the ethnic regions are ch taking on a new look every day. If you go and see such regions, you will actually feel the changes. We have certain statistics. Over the past five years, the elevation of uh, from poverty in China is that a person is uh, elevated from poverty every two seconds. So if we do a calculation, we can see the number of people leaving poverty. This is mostly focused in the northwestern parts of China. Such statistics cannot be neglected. This is part of our implementation of the convention and an important significant aspect of our defense of the rights of the ethnic minorities. Some experts asked some specific questions, including the definition on racial discrimination, the establishment of National Human Rights Institute, and so on and so forth. Our views are we must be clear in our minds what our purpose and objective are, so long as it's useful to implement the Convention to defend the human rights, states are 
different in their concrete situations. There are no uh, uh, unified answers to such questions. This is something I need to clarify. Certain members mentioned the legislation on refugees and the partic participation in certain international conventions. These are issues which we will further study and further promote the concerned efforts. Some experts also mentioned whether China will remove our reservations on certain conventions. China's consistent position is we will deal with disputes through peaceful consultation. Amongst all the conventions that we are party of, we have made reservations on certain clauses. This is our consistent position. This is not specifically targeted on these conventions. Of course, we will develop a general uh, position on all these uh, issues. Finally, I would like to share uh, met with, our mem with the members one point. Over, uh, uh, during our dialogues over the past two days, most of the members have m uh, learned more of our efforts and have asked professional questions and comments, which the Chinese delegation expresses its appreciation. But however, sir, some members call some of the unsubstantiated materials as credible information. This is something that we are concerned with. As all know, the committee has received certain materials which are from certain political organizations which openly deny China's sovereignty and seeks to split China. Amongst the materials they supply to the committee, they openly uh, do not seek any, make any reference to hide their intention to split China. Certain organizations have all forms of connections with terrorist organizations. Their so-called accusations carry obvious political intentions and are not consistent with the fact. If such materials are regarded as credible, we cannot help asking what is the basis for such judgment. Of course, we, want, we wish to uh, stress again that the Chinese government attaches great importance to the role of the committee and is ready to engage in constructive dialogues with the committee because we have this objective, that is to jointly promote the effective implementation of the convention. But the dialogue and cooperation must be based on the UN Charter's principle on respecting state sovereignty and territorial integrity. As far as this principle is concerned, the committee should share the same objective in terms of fight against terrorism. And uh, this is the real way to protect the rights of all ethnic groups. So I would like to uh, refer to the committee's general comment 21 of 1996, which points out that apart from the colonized people seeking independence and emancipation in line with the principle of self-determination, the international law does not recognize the right to split from a state by a part of a territory or a community within that state. The committee's any action under the convention cannot be interpreted as an authorization or permission to split a sovereign state. We therefore sincerely hope that the committee will make careful screening of the unsubstantiated materials from certain political groups who, split, who seek to split a state and incite confusion so that its work conforms to the norm of uh, discharging its duty in a fair and objective manner and to adopt uh, a fair and impartial view of the achievements by member states uh, in uh, defending human rights. I do apologize. My colleagues from Hong Kong and Macau will add a few words. Women and members, uh, I would just like to make a brief supplement as far as the situation in Hong Kong SAR is concerned. Um, I, specifically, I would like to respond to the question put to us by Rapporteur Mr. Morgan and Co-Rapporteur Ms. Shepard. Mr. Morgan asked about some details of the crime, hate crime situation in Hong Kong. Uh, we, we did uh, set out all the information required in our written responses. 
uh, you may refer to paragraph 4 to 15. Uh, there are 12 paragraphs there. Um, is that our statistics? Uh, this, the case specific details uh, you are interested in. As to the question put to us by Ms. Shepard, um, you are concerned about education, implementation, uh, evaluation of impact. Uh, all the information is set out in uh, written responses as well. Uh, it is in paragraph uh, 112 to 122. There are 11 paragraphs there, so quite detailed information. That's my supplement, Mr. Chairman. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Mr. Kut, I know that you're very good at summarizing, at being concise and exact. So uh, given that, I can actually only give you two or three minutes. Given that it is now four minutes to one, um, and so we only have four minutes to summarize the work this morning. So there you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Delegation, for all the information, extra information that you have provided. Uh, my overall sentiment is, uh, uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chair, is uh, 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 disappointment because um, I, I think most of the answers were very defensive and uh, um, Basically, uh, was in a, uh, express it, was it were expressed in a way to reject some of the questions as baseless and uninformative. I'm sure the high-level and large delegation from China does not consider this body of experts uh, believing in various lies and repeating them in a dialogue with yourselves. I'm sure you didn't come all the way from China to basically say that everything is okay and there is not, not much to be done. So in that sense, I don't want to use up much of the time, but I think uh, we could have had a much better opportunity for a fruitful discussion to ameliorate the situation in China, which is for China itself, not for us. Thank you, Chair. Monsieur Kut. Mr. Kut, thank you very much. Given that we have just a few minutes remaining before the end of this working session this morning, I would like to use this time to thank civil society for being present here today and for the interest that they have taken in our discussion, in this constructive dialogue. This dialogue between, obviously, the committee and the delegation. So this was a constructive dialogue also between the delegation members and the NGOs. And so thank you very much for all of that. Thank you to civil society. I would also like to thank the delegation. I would like to thank them for all of the efforts they have undertaken. Given the hundreds and hundreds of questions asked of them, I would also like to thank them because they have made available to us written documents, written responses to the questions that we raised. And for that, I thank them. I would also like to say to the delegation that our committee works on the exclusive basis of the convention.
and that our committee as is a legal committee rather than a political committee. All of the provisions in our conventions are exclusively legal in nature and it's upon this exclusive basis that our committee works And when reports are submitted to the committee, these are the basis upon which we have debates between committee members and the relevant delegation. And so, once again, we would like to say that this committee is not a court of justice. It's not a tribunal. It's made up of experts elected by state's party to the convention. And this is the basis upon which the committee works. And so the goal of the committee is to respect the state's party to the convention because they've been given the moral and legal responsibility of implementing the convention. And this is how we work and we can never be substituted by a tribunal or a court of justice. That's important that we know and that we recognise that fact. This is how this committee functions and once again we function only upon a legal basis and in no scenario can our functions be assimilated uh, by anything else, nor can we take on any other function. And so that's why I would like to say to the Chinese delegation that this committee, once again, has really had the true honour and dignity of receiving this delegation here. within the framework of the convention, that is to say the legal framework of this convention. Now, I might say a little more because the interpreters have given us a few more minutes. And it is indeed this tradition's committee to finally give the floor to the head of delegation, who to whom I give the floor now, before closing this working session. You have the floor, Chair of de Delegation. Usually, the follow-up rapporteur now, if the follow-up rapporteur would like to give the rapporteur a few minutes, yes. But I think I know this committee a little after seven years here. And so on that basis, the follow-up rapporteur usually tends to have the final word because they suggest the final conclusions on the committee's work. There you go. So, Mr. Morgan, take the floor if you want to. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, and I, I, I didn't have time before. I just wanted to brief before saying thank you for the Chinese delegation on torture that I was speaking the last time. I wanted just to, to in order for the China to, if they can give us responses on written some cases that I was raising, like the information from Uyghur detainees to be held in communicado for prolonged periods, such as the cases of Pusai Naifu, Abu Dorashiti, Iran Toti, and the relatives of Judera Hoga and Rebilla Kadir, put him at, at risk of torture and other ill treatment. We have re received information about that, that's what I was telling. And also about Tenzin Delek Rimponj, a monk who I understand died in prison in 2015 under unclear circumstance. And also about the received information we have received about Rebija Kadir's sons who were imprisoned before in retaliation for her human rights advocacy and that 
Alikim Abrijim was repeatedly tortured as the information we have and held in solitary confinement for over a month in 2010. So that was, I want to ask if they can answer in the in their written responses, will China facilitate the establishment of an independent mechanism to promptly, impartially, and effectively investigate all custodial deaths, disappearances, allegations of torture, and ill treatment and reported use of excessive force against persons in the autonomous region of Tibet and neighboring Tibetan prefectures and counties, and in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region? When does China plan to allow independent experts to conduct an investigation into the death in custody of ethnic minorities? And just one last thing that I, I didn't have time to say about the hukou system. The state party indicates that by 2020, it will eliminate the distinction between agricultural and non-agricultural resident registration and will set up a unified system of urban and rural household registration. However, reports indicate that recent efforts to reform the hukou system have not produced substantial positive changes for rural migrants, including ethnic minorities. Those were the two issues I couldn't raise. Sorry, Mr. Chair. And before uh, uh, leaving the floor to the Chinese delegation, I would like to say thank you to the delegation of China, uh, SAR Hong Kong China and SAR Macau China. That the, thank you for the lots of work you have done and the lot of good responses that you have given to us. Thank you so much for the uh, co-rapporteurs, Ms. Gay McDougall and Ms. Berin Shepherd, for their great help they're great help to, because in, it, we're talking about China that represents 21% of the population of the world. And I think we should have more time as we're having. Thanks for the interpreters, but I think we need much more. I would get, like to give also a big thank to uh, Anjali, OACH, or, our OACHR officer that is helping in this case. I would also like to have a big thank to the civil society organization for their great help for all the reports they have sent. In this committee, we give a lot of importance for the civil society organizations and for the report they are given. And we believe that we, we believe in the freedom of expression of civil society, and that is a, a lot of help for us. Thanks for uh, this very interesting dialogue. And as I said, thanks, of course, for the interpreters for giving more time, more time for us so that we really need them. And I hope, uh, as I said at the beginning, we're talking about a country that represents. <laughs> We are talking about a country that represents the 21% of the population of the world. So I think this dialogue is very important for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. During this dialogue, the Chinese delegation, including the central government and Hong Kong Macau SAR governments, in a cooperative, open, responsible uh, uh, attitude and with professionalism, carried out a constructive dialogue with members. We highly esteem all members of the committee. In our dialogue, we took a, respons a responsive and factual attitude. This point should not be questioned. Just now, Mr. Chair, you mentioned that indeed the Chinese regime did a lot of work in order to respond to the questions by members. We provided a lot of information. Of course, there are members who are not happy with, with answers to the questions, and we hope we'll have opportunity to have further exchange. If the committee wants us to provide more information, so long as it is within the mandate of the committee, I, I believe we will provide information. However, I would also like to point out that with regard to certain questions which are not factual, such being the case, I'm afraid we cannot give you the response that you're looking for. We are also aware that there are forces outside who want to politicize the committee. However, we believe that the committee has sufficient wisdom to, in a fair, objective and comprehensive way, deal with relevant questions. Eliminating racial discrimination is a daunting task facing the whole international community. On behalf of the Chinese delegation, I would like to reaffirm that China is steadfast in its opposition to racial discrimination and in its commitment, commitment to ethnic equality, um, 
solidarity and harmony. In the process of its development, China will continue to conscientiously implement the convention and improve the enjoyment of human rights of all ethnic groups. China will continue to attach great importance to its cooperation with the committee. We reiterate our welcome to members of the committee to visit China to further know the real situation there, to carry out exchange with people concerned. In conclusion, once again, I would like to thank Mr. Chair for your excellent guidance. I would like to thank experts, the secretary, the interpreters for their hard work. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Le thank you very much to the head of delegation. And now we can finally say that we've finished our work this morning. And so this meeting is closed. <laughs>